What's happening, everybody? How y'all doing out there? Today's guest is Christopher Todd of Brooklyn's own Sonnet, whose last couple of releases could be found in Profound Lore, and who recently completed a five-week tour in Europe with a stop at the infamous Roadburn Festival, as well as a series of tours here in the States throughout the years. But we got into bizarre shows in New Orleans, where I just happened to have gotten back from, his classic rock dad and his early punk rock influences, as well as hardcore shows, plus acrylic kits, you know I'm a fan of them, and a whole lot more. Shout out to my sponsor, New Orleans Record Press. If you're looking to put out vinyl for your project, go on over to neworleansrecordpress.com to check out the many coloring, packaging, and mastering options. Plus, you can add it all up in the real-time quote generator right there on the site. Need assistance with design or packaging? They can help you. And they print 12 and 7-inch records in both 150 and 180 gram variants. They also print small runs of 100 and larger runs up into the thousands. And that's the one and only neworleansrecordpress.com. Crash Bang Boom Podcast can be found on iTunes Podcast, my SoundCloud and YouTube pages, Stitcher, Luminary, Google Play, Podbean, and more. If you like what you hear, feel free to check out any of the previous nearly 150 episodes and give me a like, a subscription, a positive rating, a glowing review, and or all the above. I mean, fuck, go for it, right? The support is appreciated. So here we go, Christopher Todd, Sonnet. Check him out live if you haven't already. It's a wall of sound with some badass projections. Good times to be had. Crash, bang, boom. Sounds go mad with joy. Christopher Todd of Sonnet, my fellow Brooklynite, Greenpoint guy. What's happening, dude? How might you be doing? What's going on, neighbor? How are you? I'm good, man. We got the the correct mic setting on this thing going this time, so uh, when people listen to it, it won't sound like complete shit. I feel like we're <laughs> off to a great start. Things can go only only go up from here, man. I know, man. Awesome. <laughs> Well, dude, uh, I really dug the show that I saw recently with y'all. I know y'all been around for a while, playing in Brooklyn. You, I know you've done some tours recently, went to Europe. We'll talk about that. Tell me a little bit about this Vita show. I always love playing there. I noticed you were uh, appearing to be playing a Vistalite kit. I also have one. I'm a fan of, uh, of those kits. It sound, tell me the story behind that drum set, because it sounded pretty monstrous coming, uh, coming through that system. Yeah, I mean, that kit that I play... Uh, it's an amber Vista light. Yeah. Um, like a replica of a John Bottom model, pretty much. So it's a newer one. It, it It's about, at this point, I want to say probably close to 15 years old. Gotcha. All yeah, right. Yeah. So I bought it brand new um, and just automatically, I was like, you know what? This might be the last drum set that I ever buy because really? I liked it that much. I'm not the best at tuning my drums yeah. <laughs> or maybe I'm just uh, lazy about it, <laughs> Yeah. but no matter what I do or what I don't do to that kit, uh-huh. it just miraculously always sounds fine. That's awesome. <laughs> so I mean, that's what yeah. you want. My bandmates hate me for it, especially our guitarist, because he always thinks it sounds like shit. And then when the sound guy's like, man, this drum set sounds great, man. And I'm like... <laughs> Point my finger, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. Totally. The modern ones with the bearing edges and the design of them, and they just feel more dense. Like mine's like a 73, 74, I think. Okay. Uh, pre, pre 75, I believe it is because the 12 inch Tom has us has smaller lugs mm-hmm. than the 13 does. So mm-hmm. it's one of the ways of dating it. I, I could always look up the, the badge numbers on them, but I have, yeah. but, uh, because of that, it's a little, it's, it's old, man. I mean, it's older than me and I'm 43. So that kit's been around, you know, Yeah. but, uh, it does sound awesome, but unlike yours, I feel like I can only put one head on it and it's generally the, the Remo black dot that Bonham played and a lot of the Vista light guys play that. I put that head on and it's, it's generally good. Amazingly enough. Yep. That's what I have on mine. Uh, I got, it a, is. I got a 14 inch rack Okay. and a, um, I have both an 18 inch Tom and yeah. a 16 inch, but I primarily use a 16. Gotcha. Um, but you use the 16, not as a rack Tom though. No, no, no. Floor tom. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. So you got the bottom side, you know, 26 inch bass drum. Well, 26 originally, but, uh, I had a custom, uh, 22 by 18 made. Oh, interesting. You went deep on it. Interesting. Yeah. I had to go through, um, I believe it was a uh, Chicago drum exchange. Okay. And they had to order it through Ludwig for me custom because Lustig yeah. won't sell Ludwig won't sell to the public. Wow. So I had to go that route, but sounds great. So 24 by 18, 22, 22 by 18. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Huh? It's cool, man. Yeah. That's wild. It's got a lot of punch. Yeah. Yeah. It's 
funny i grew up uh playing like marching band and stuff and uh so those drums are always a little more narrow right so on those vintage kits uh whether it's a lot of the gretsch jazz kits or the slinger lens or rogers or ludwig or any of those most of those depths were were more shallow closer to 14 inches and i started out as well my early kits were had that depth of bass drum so to this day it just it it makes it I feel it feels more natural. It sounds more natural, and the response seems I, I could be completely crazy faster to me. Really, which is interesting. So yeah, the deep, deeper bass drums kind of psych me out a little bit. Hmm. I know that's very interesting. Yeah, my my original uh, kick drum is twenty six by fourteen. Right, and the reason that I wanted to get a twenty two by eighteen customly made was because I felt like I wasn't getting enough response. Huh. off the 14 right especially if uh you're doing any type of double kick work right so, yeah i used it i used a 26 by 14 kick drum on our first record yeah known flood and then everything since then i've used the 22 nice yeah. and you've used and, and at the same toms as well the vista light toms on the records the first record um was uh primarily the 26 by 14 kick drum mm -hmm. 14 rack and the 18 inch floor tom. Yeah, big ass uh, drums. Yeah, yeah. We recorded that um, with uh, Colin Marston cool. of Kralis. Yeah, yeah. And he definitely got the huge sound out of those drums. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I'm a fan of it, man. I, I have recorded with mine as well and kind of had mixed results. But then again, once you close mic that drum set, you can hear some of the things that you may not hear as much in, an, in a live environment. Right. You know? My only knock on them is the, is the floor tom. Um, it gets so much like overtone over and just like the uh -huh. wo -wo 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 the 18 wo -wo 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 both the 18 and the 16 really especially in the live format mm -hmm. so we usually just end up like gating everything you know yeah live but but same deal with the heads man uh like you said exactly the remo black dot yeah that's it bam the only especially for live the only thing on this last the last record that we recorded i used uh coded Oh, like coded really just to get a a little bit more uh i guess deader mm -hmm. tone out of it in general yeah. you know yeah yeah and it, the results were pretty good i yeah. was happy yeah i'm a fan of coded heads generally on recordings mm -hmm. i generally just go with that as yep. a rule i yeah. feel like yeah but uh that's 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 really interesting and once again i think you can have a little bit more flexibility just because they're, they're a little bit better designed i feel like you know but that that's cool the drums sound great on the recordings and once again live i think i thought they sounded awesome they cut through live yeah, they yeah did. it's 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 amazing i mean those acrylic drums especially Ludwig yeah, yeah. with the plug <laughs> yeah uh, right <laughs> yeah but it's I mean live it's just I mean you know the drums are battling the guitar and that's hard exactly as far as volume but. I was gonna say I mean as part of what y'all do because part of the way it comes off on recordings and that's cool and I think it's an aspect of what y'all do live as well it seems like a good bit of stage volume big time <laughs> yeah yeah i mean say, that is captured i mean i think yeah. that's interesting you know because yeah. sometimes bands can sound live on a recording and then you realize live their stage volume is actually quite low we tear the line yeah you know as far as uh, we've always been a very uh loud and extreme band live mm -hmm. and sometimes on record it's it's hard to capture that you know right for sure um so you know for a while we've we've had a lot of pride and you know hey you know you like the record well come see our live show. You know right. what I mean? Because then you get the projections bit, in addition to that, so it's the, the it's whole different show. different experience. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And y'all have been predominantly an, an instrumental band, I guess, with, this, with the exception of the last couple of songs that y'all put out. Has it's, it's been... We have always been an instrumental band. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, we did a uh, our 7-inch, you're probably referencing. Yeah. Um, which was, uh, was put out this past May mm -hmm. uh, via Profound Lore. Yeah. And um, it consisted of a, uh, a track that we originally released for Adult Swim. Oh, really? Nice. Yeah, and then we re-recorded it in the studio during our last full length, but it didn't make the record. Oh, okay. So we were sitting on this really good recording of it. Right. And we had never uh, pressed it. So uh, we did a 7-inch, that on one side, and then a cover of a Joy Division track nice. that we did for Colt Nation mm -hmm. a few years back where we had uh, Josh Strawn from Vora, um, fellow uh, Louisianian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, uh, sing on it. So nice. that was the only track. Yeah, yeah. Besides, um, you know, he wouldn't be happy if I didn't uh, note this, but on our first record, uh, David Castillo 
nice. of Primitive Weapons. Sure. St. Vitus Bar. Yeah. Did some uh, experimental vocals, I'll call them, on okay. our first record. <laughs> so you wouldn't know them. Okay. Unless I told you. Gotcha. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Who pushed for the projections? And is that's, that's something that y'all been doing for quite some time, right? It was. So... Son had originally started as a two piece. Mm-hmm. Um, when John, the guitar player, and I were living in uh, Philadelphia, and it started as a just extremely experimental band, um, experimented with a lot of field recordings, a lot of electronics, live instrumentation, and we put together a record uh, that was never released, self released. Took a hiatus, and yeah. then I moved to New York, and then John soon after followed, yeah. and we decided to start from scratch, keep the name, and we wrote um, a few songs as a two-piece, and then we found AJ, our bass player, nice. and AJ uh, brought the vision of both lights and the visual aspect yeah. to Son Hit. Nice. So that was... He had to convince us a little bit. Really? Know? Yeah, because, I mean, at first, like, John and I, like, all right, all right. Like, you know. Just, like, extra shit. I mean, yeah, <laughs> Godspeed already did this. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. You know, uh, stuff like that. And we're yeah. like, all right, you know what? Learn these bass parts, first and foremost. Of course. And then, you know, do your thing and then bring it to the table. Yeah. And he brought it to the table. And ever since, we've been enhancing it to, yeah. I mean, what our live setup is now. Right. Yeah. Does he come from a, a, an animation background or, or, or video editing? or? Yeah, a little bit of both. Both John and AJ are designers. Ah. Uh-huh. Um, so they uh, are very, uh, you know, uh, entrenched in that world. Yeah. So where I'm like, that's not my forte, man. Like, all, all I do is play drums, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. It definitely adds to it. And I, I certainly appreciate it when it happens, but especially with, uh, with instrumental bands in particular, and then even that much more, I think, with a band such as yours that has such a, a, a big sonic, almost soundtrack-esque quality to it, having that visual component with it. It obviously adds to it, so I it certainly adds, appreciate it. Yeah, man, it adds a lot. I mean, I'm sure like you can contest to this, like you know, you, you've seen some instrumental bands that put on amazing shows, and then you've probably seen some instrumental bands where you're kind of like, the band's great technically, but yeah, I, it's I'd rather listen tough. to this on record, right? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And not having a singer to take most of the attention off the front of the stage, right? It's tough. So I mean. I feel like we, it's a good balance with us, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. So we'll, we'll play until we're ready to fall off the stage and die. And yeah. then you can watch something cool while, while we're playing, you know? Yeah, man. So. Speaking of, of, of good sound in, uh, instrumental records, the, the, that new Russian circles record, I, I don't know if you've checked it out. It sounds so good. I've heard good things. I it's, haven't had a chance to check it out. Yet. It's killer. Yeah. Do you get burnt out on instrumental music yourself or do you still listen to it outside, outside of your own endeavors? I do, yeah. Um, as an instrumental band, I like to listen to a lot of... I mean, I'm pretty diverse, man. I'm all over the place. Yeah. From, you know, hardcore to metal to hip-hop, you know, old and new, um, mm-hmm. experimental, electronic, you name it. Like, you know, Godspeed is a huge mm-hmm. like influence of mine, you yeah. know, as far as the um, instrumental standpoint goes by. Mm-hmm. And then just bands that we've toured with, too. Um you know, I, you know, this will destroy you is one, you know, like it, for me, like you can listen to a band on record. And then like, if you actually have the experience of like playing and touring with these bands, mm-hmm. you have a new, like profound respect for it. Sure. Know? Getting to know them, getting to know the dynamic within the band, seeing it every night and then in them, them, them still winning you over potentially. There's yeah. a lot of, a lot of aspects to it for sure. But yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, you mentioned as of, was it this year or the prior, uh, one where y'all did your first European tour and then came back to the States and did a whole nother U S tour. Yeah. So we've been a band, we've been a, a full band since 2012. Okay. And, um, you know, we've done a lot of cool shows, festivals, uh, fly outs, uh, you know, coast to coast, you know, Canada, but we never, the, we never had the opportunity to, to go to Europe and like do it for real. Right. Um, and the opportunity presented itself based around Roadburn. Last oh, year. nice. Yeah. So, um, we went to Europe for about four to five weeks. 
Wow. And did the whole thing. Played some amazing festivals, including Roadburn. Yeah. Came home for a couple of weeks and then did the whole U.S. How long was the U.S. tour? It's about three weeks. Gotcha. Yeah. So there was some shitty drives in that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I bet there was. <laughs> yeah. yeah, big time. That's yeah. killer, though. Five weeks in Europe, man, for your first for your first run, no less. And you're playing yeah. Roadburn. I mean, that's yeah. awesome. Did yeah. you see some killer bands at the road at Roadburn? I did. Yeah. Anyone in particular? Yeah. Playing for Burial. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah, which he actually... So, Tom's a good friend of ours, and uh, he was on our last record. Okay. Made a cameo. Okay. And uh, he happened to uh, get the invite to Roadburn when we did. Nice. So, he actually got on stage with us and played some tunes, and then, of course, you know, we got to check out his his live set. And, I, you know, again, it goes back to, like, you know, meeting musicians and, like, becoming friends and, like, respecting mm. what they do. Sure. So, I'm sure he could say the same thing, like, seeing us and that format mm-hmm. of Roburn, you know, and then seeing like him perform his stuff. It's, you know, it's, it's pretty cool, man. to see like people like on that platform, on yeah. that stage, you know, for sure. So, and they said the name of the band is playing for burial, planning for burial, planning for burial. Mm-hmm. I'm not familiar with them. I got to check them out. One piece. Really? One piece gloom act. Really? Yeah. Bizarre. You would probably dig it. Okay. Yeah. I got to check it out. Yeah. Nice. Where were of the spots that y'all hit up in Europe? Were there were there any ones in particular that really blew you, blew your blinds? We had some good shows, man. Um, <clears throat> Berlin was fun. Yeah, people came out. London was fun. Um, Copenhagen was a blast. Really? Yeah, we played a festival in Copenhagen. Okay. Um, and it was we played in this this giant theater, like this old theater, and we played another festival called Colossal. Oh no, Colossal was in Copenhagen. Okay. And then we played this other festival in Germany, uh, Leipzig Mm -hmm. was the town. And we played in this giant, old, early 1900s uh, concrete theater. Whoa. Um, And it was awesome. Really? Like the sound in there was incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It was fun. Nice. Did y'all make it to the Netherlands? Hence your namesake for those that might not know. We did. Really? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Yeah, we were, I mean, I tell everybody this all the time. It's like. We <laughs> we toured for three weeks straight without any days off. Right. And man, everyone's like, So how was it? You know, how how, how was that lifestyle? And I'm mm-hmm. like I was like, I can tell you everything you wanna know or don't wanna know about every single rest stop bathroom that's and what rest it is. stop in general. Yeah, yeah. Like throughout all of Europe. That's what it is. I said, because that's pretty much all I saw. <laughs> like you know what I mean? Like yeah, yeah I mean it's like you play a show and then you don't get out of there until late. And then you, you know, go to where you're sleeping. You crash out. You get up early. And then you got to drive all day to get to where you're going. Right. You might see, like, a little bit of the town if you have a day off in it or a couple hours before you're set. Yeah, but you it know? Much. But that's it. Yeah. 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 It's a lot of hurrying up and waiting a lot, and a lot of public bathrooms. Yes. I can tell you what bathrooms you need to pay for <laughs> throughout every country and which ones you don't. Okay. Or which ones you choose not to pay for. Just, yeah, yeah. Rather than <laughs> yeah. your standard tourist book of tourist sites, you need to hit up bathrooms that you should pay for. Yeah. Yeah, man. Nice. Yep. But, uh, <laughs> you know, the experience was great. And we were, you know, well, it was well received over there. Great. So it was cool. Any plans of going back? Um. Yeah. Yeah. I think right now we're... You know, right now we're, we're working on some new stuff slowly. Yeah. But, um, you know, uh, in lieu of that, if something comes up, we'll certainly entertain it. Sure. And then for sure after when it's all said and done with this next record that we might try to birth here. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, whenever that might be. Nice. But, and everyone's uh, been able to keep themselves flexible in their lives enough to entertain these ideas and be able to go out for that long. That's always the, the balance and act that becomes a slippery slope as we age, especially. Tell you me know. about it. It's <laughs> tough. I actually had to. So when we went to Europe, so when we did the Europe tour in the States, huh. I had to leave my job of 11 years. No way. Yeah. Dude, what yeah. a fucking commitment. Yeah, I left my job of 11 years. Just do it, man, you know, because of every band that I've ever played in, like this band is kind of like my, my child, you uh-huh. know, and I was like, well, you know, we got all these cool offers, like, you know, I didn't, I wanted to do it, and I didn't want to let anyone else down, you know, Right. so, yeah, we did it, and um, actually, lo and behold, like, I'm, at, I'm back at the job that I left, because 
Yeah. And, you know, he was like, take as much time off as you need and then just come back. Wow. And then it just, it kind of all worked out after the fact. You right. You know what I mean? But, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's tough. It's a balancing act. Big depending time. Depending on where you're at in life as an individual. Fuck yeah, dude. You know, and especially in this city, man. I mean, you can't. It's ridiculous. You can't, uh, you know, it's not cheap. No. You know, so. <laughs> Don't have kids. You wouldn't believe the expenses that comes with that. Uh, I'll tell you afterwards what we pay for daycare here in Greenpoint. I can imagine. Yeah, <laughs> oh. I can imagine. Ooh. Yeah. Wow. That's why I drink so much. At least that's what I blame it on. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Well, when y'all came back to the United States, uh, where, if y'all, when y'all went out for those three weeks, what uh, what were some of the places that y'all ended up uh, and and enjoyed and you know hitting up or maybe spots that you've gone back to, et cetera? Yeah, Philly's obviously fun. Yeah, just because like we have roots there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and friends there. Austin is always a good time. Always. We always have a good time in Austin. Yeah. Um, L.A. Really. Always. Really. Man, let me tell you, it's New York and L.A. for us. <laughs> really. In the states. Wow. Yeah. yeah. New York. L.A., um, San Fran. Cool. Chicago. Yeah. People come out in Chicago. A city that I, to this day, have still not been to. I've been to most of the United States throughout most of it, and somehow still Detroit and Chicago I have yet to happen. Yeah. Chicago, I put on a respect level like New York. As really? Far as, as far as shows. Wow. And people's commitment to going out. Yeah. It's cool. Yep. Fucking A, man. Yeah. So you, do the, you did the five weeks. You said you had a couple weeks off, then you went out for the three weeks. So it was... That was a that was a stretch. It was a stretch. Were y'all not ready to kill each other after that shit? <laughs> I guess that's one of the well, you know. You got kids, I guess that's why I drink. <laughs> <laughs> Your bandmates? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I hear you. Yeah. Do you all practice here in, in Brooklyn or in Greenpoint even? We do. We practice over in Bushwick. Okay. Yeah, we've had a few spaces, um, primarily all in Bushwick. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm on my fifth space and I think I've lost all of them at one point or another because they were going to either build construction or something like that. Yeah. You know, clubs get shut down, practice spaces get shut down. It becomes, inc- that's a whole nother aspect of living in New York. Yeah. And which sucks, you know, like we were just saying about, uh, you know, living in general, I mean, practice space rent is almost like an apartment rent. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> it's, like, it's insane. You end up having to, or you have to get so many people to share it to make it affordable that then it becomes a, its own pain in the ass Yeah, and manage it a bunch of dummies. <laughs> bunch of guy, a bunch of people in bands. Yep. You got yep. it. Yep. Oh my God, man. So here we are t- talking obviously about drumming and whatnot. You loving this uh, acrylic kit that you have. When, uh, when did you first start playing the drums? Third grade. Third grade. Damn, that's pretty early, man. I can't remember what age I was in third grade, but that's yeah. what sticks in my head. Third grade. Yep. Gotcha. Yeah. What about what was your first kit? And your, did your parents reluctantly get it for you? Well, uh, funny story is um, the year before I got a drum kit, I got a guitar. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Because so my dad's a guitarist. Oh, okay. And um, Did he play in bands when you were growing up? Or that, just kind of around the house? That's what you want to call cover bands. <laughs> You know what I mean? So he did his thing on weekends, you know, probably mm-hmm. made a couple bucks. He probably paid, made more in cover bands than I made in original. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be willing to bet you that yeah, that's the case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That is one of the benefits of doing it. It gets you a yard pass on the weekends, and then that, they at least know that you're not completely fucking off, and at least you're bringing back some money that you can throw at God yeah, only knows what. Yeah, exactly, yeah. He had this piece of shit van that he only used just to, like, move his gear. Nice. Yeah. But um, he got me a guitar. Uh-huh. And just, just didn't, didn't, didn't take stick. to it, man, at yeah. all, at all. Yeah. And then I think the following year, uh, either for Christmas or my birthday, I got my first drum set, um, which was a uh, Yamaha Stage Custom. Oh, nice. All right. Yep. And that was it. Yeah. It was just permanently set up in my parents' garage. Mm-hmm. And... I just took to it. Really? Didn't yeah. drive the neighbors crazy? You were able to get away with it? I'm sure I did. Yeah. Yeah. Depending on the time of day. And your parents. Were they were they rethinking the whole thing? I always wonder about that. But at least they know where you are. And I don't know. They, yeah. My parents dealt with it. I mean, drummer's parents, that's what they deal with. Hey, they bought it for me. Right. <laughs> they knew what they were getting themselves into. Come on. You know? The kids smashing yeah. some drums, making a shit ton of noise in the garage. Yeah. Yeah. What uh, kind of music was being played in the house? My dad was always a classic rock guy. Yeah, yeah. Deep Purple, Led Zeppelin, 
he had a vinyl collection too. I mm-hmm. mean, ZZ Top, Jethro Tull. Yeah, yeah. Uh, All the Skinner, classic rock stuff, sure. You know, uh, Almond Brothers. I mean, you, yeah, you yeah. know, just down that classic whole rock, seventies classic rock. Yeah, yeah I yeah. love that shit. So I kind of grew up, you know, basically listening to a lot of that until I got of a certain age, you know, to make my own decisions. What corrupted you? What what music corrupted you and put you down the Dark Lord's path? Man, well, like I said, I was always diverse, so, yeah. you know, 90s hip-hop definitely corrupted me. But, yeah. <laughs> um, Still my favorite. It is known as the golden years of hip-hop. I mean, I... I with listen, reason. Daily, I listen to a lot, you know? I rock it, too. Yeah. But um, as far as, like, drumming, uh, you know, influences... Um, I pretty much taught myself how to play the kit and I used to literally just set up with headphones and a disc man. Yeah. And, um, uh, an early one that I used to just try and play along to was helmet. Right on. You know, helmet oh, yeah. was a giant influence for me. Oh, for everybody that was alive in the nineties. Yeah. I talk about it all the time. John Stanier is about as influential as you get. I mean, and I, from jock bands, I would go see them and I'd be like, this guy's quoting John Stanier or trying to, Yeah, you know, yeah. I, I certainly to this day, I'm like, yeah, that's, I'm doing some John Stanier shit there. Dude. It still lasts to this day, that influence. So Helmet, uh, Quicksand was another Fuck one. Fuck yeah, Alan Cage, yeah. And um, I mean, it's so funny just like how like worlds collide, at, like, you know, it's like I, I, I literally recall like practicing, like trying to practice like those drum parts yeah. to a disc man by myself in my parents' garage. And then you fast forward like years later and I get to meet some of these guys yeah. and play shows with them. Right. And like, you know, have a shot of whiskey with them. It's yeah. like, it, it's mind blowing actually, you know, like two helmet and quicksand. Like I've met like, yeah. you know, John and Alan. It's crazy. Did yeah. you meet John when he was playing at Battles? I did. Really? Did did Sonnet play with Battles? Yeah. Really? That's awesome, yeah. man. So Sonnet did a show for Hopscotch Festival cool. in Raleigh, North Carolina, and uh, we were direct support for Battles. That's awesome. We played, got off stage, and John was kind of like, give me a little nod. Like, yeah. Oh, thanks, man. You know what I mean? Like, So they <laughs> played, and they did their thing, and then they got off stage, came backstage, and Stainer was wearing a button-up collar, long sleeve shirt. Just, it literally looked like he jumped in a pool. Oh, it's ridiculous. I just I, soaked. I believe it. Completely soaked. I right? know. I, I don't know how anybody could. It makes me feel like shit. I, I wear like a cutoff and shorts. I don't give a shit if it's the winter or not. I don't care. I'm <laughs> yeah. not, I can't do that to myself. Right. I'll see stars. I just feel like shit, man. Yeah, dude. Yeah, he was, it was intense. That's a commitment. Just to, for the sake of wearing a nice shirt, he's willing to nearly put himself in the hospital with yeah. heat exhaustion. Yeah. Dehydration. Well, he was trying to jump, you know, to hit that symbol. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. right? You, know? you got to look good when you're reaching for a symbol that's 10 feet up in the fucking yeah. air. But he came, <laughs> they got off stage and he came back. I never let go out of my way to, like, kind of do, like, starstruck stuff, you know? Uh-huh. But he came back and I probably gave him, like, a good, like, two minutes <laughs> yeah and he's just drenched just standing like looking around like the green room i go up and i'm like great set man i know you just got off stage but i gotta tell you i pretty much grew up listening to your drumming and teaching myself how to play the kit yeah and he was like you know what i appreciate that man he was like you guys kicked ass blah blah blah, blah. and he looked over at the table and he was like you see that bottle over there <laughs> bottle of jamo and i was like yeah and he's like you want to help me drink it and i'm like how do i say no yeah yeah you definitely don't that's what you don't do is say no so that was my uh my hang story with uh mr stainer yeah yeah that's amazing going back to when you were first starting to play in some of your early bands what are some of your memories about about early shows because i i certainly have mine and shout out to uh uh, I'm glad that I just mentioned this, actually. Uh, one of my friends uh, just unfortunately passed away. He was a few years older than me. He had a massive heart attack. He passed away. Rest in peace, John Anderson. But uh, on my first gig that I ever played, we only had like six songs. And we play. And like, you know, some of our friends from high school showed up. And they wanted to hear another song. And I asked, uh, I believe it was John Anderson that night, the guy that passed away. I said, say, man, is there any way we could just play one more song? It's We, we already played it. We're just going to recycle the first song that we played. We don't have anything else. And he could just tell that we were young, you know, silly kids. And he was like, yeah, man, go for it. 
and it was super cool. And later on, it snowed that night in New Orleans. So it was one of the trippiest fucking experiences ever. You know, I played my first show, super cool. The last band, the band that he played in was this band, Nut. That was really amazing. And uh, so there you go. Rest in peace, John Anderson. Thanks for letting a bunch of young, silly kids play an extra jam that night. Yeah, I mean, firstly, my condolences. Yeah, of course, it's crazy, you know? man. Life is crazy. It is. It really is. <laughs> But uh, tell me a little bit about some of your, your first shows. From grade school through middle school, I was in a uh, school band. Uh-huh. I was in it, too. So concert band, yep. stage band, mm-hmm. jazz ensemble, mm-hmm. percussion ensemble, all yep. that shit, you know? And then in high school, I was like, I just want to fuck off and skate and like do whatever I want. <laughs> and, like drink and smoke weed you know? yeah. <laughs> so there you go yeah. and, and hate on everything but, right uh um but yeah um early on i don't know i, can't, I don't know if i remember my first show man Is that really bad? yeah that's wild yeah but a lot of punk bands mm-hmm I played in a lot of punk bands. Did y'all play like sh- like house parties and shit like that, or like where did punk bands play? Or like VFWs, VFW halls. Man, that yeah. was the, that was the thing, yeah. right? VFWs, um, some like fire halls sometimes. Right. Um, any place that would have uh, an underage night. Exactly. You know. Yeah. Um, uh, I never did any battle of the bands. Mm-hmm. Never got into that. We did that. You know? right? We did that at the high school, like out on the football field. Oh, wow. It was ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, a lot of punk bands. I guess it was like, you know, it was like the thing then. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, where I grew up anyways. So by the time you were in high school, I guess what year was that? I graduated in 01. Okay. So late so, 90s. Yeah. Late gotcha. 90s. Yeah. Gotcha. So and then coming from Jersey, I mean, you know, late 90s early 2000s there you know like you know as far as punk goes like you know everyone liked lifetime and like kid dynamite and stuff like that mm-hmm. you know so that's also that you're that you're that's absolutely when new metal is starting to happen well i was definitely into like screamo mm-hmm. big time and metalcore and like stuff like that right you know? yeah that's when that like, stuff was starting to happen as well right yeah late dude. 90s the early 2000s yeah man i i used to uh you know, me and a couple of friends, we would always just, we would either drive to Philly mm-hmm. or we would drive to New York. Right. And like early 2000s, like I, I would go to like shows at the original ABC No Rio, mm-hmm. you know? And yeah, like, yeah. To this day, like some of like the shows and lineups that I was able to see, like, old hardcore and like screamo shows. So, uh-huh. It's crazy. Was there any particular shows that, that to this day you uh, look back on and just can't even believe it? Yeah. I mean... There was a spot in West Philly called the Kill Time, uh-huh. and I've gone to a lot of cool shows there, man. Um, There's two shows really. One was in Ben Salem, PA, at this VFW. I got to see Shy Halud play. Cool. When Chad Gilbert was doing vocals, Hearts Once Nourished era for me. I oh, was like, cool. Yeah, I was stoked on that one. <laughs> and then in Philly, at, at that Kill Time spot, there's one show, man. I went to. It was like Red Roses for a Blue Lady. Poison the Well. Oh, okay. Um, Hope's Fall mm-hmm. and like Love Lost but Not Forgotten. Mm-hmm. Like all in the same bill. You know, I remember like the guy from uh, Love Lost but Not Forgotten. He was playing an acrylic kit. It was one of the first ones I ever saw live. Oh, interesting. It was Emerald Green. It was a Fibes. Wow. It was a Fibes kit. Whoa, that kit's worth a lot of money right now. Yeah, man. Yeah, he told me man, he bought it somewhere in like Memphis or something. Wow. But, you know, like those type of shows stick with yeah. you. Yeah. You know? That's also sure. a cool era because also bands like like Dillinger and Botch and those bands were Absolutely. starting to do their thing. Cave in. Cave in. Converge. So, really converge. Yeah, converge. Yeah. So like that that stuff was happening. It was yeah. like, Jesus Christ, you know? Yep. And even some of the heavier, like like noisier kind of uh, hardcore stuff like Dead Guy and stuff like that. Sure. So there's there's all that yeah. stuff and almost all of it I feel like is happening on the Northeast Coast with the exception of maybe Botch out of, out of Seattle. But a lot of it was was happening out here. A lot of it, probably because of I would imagine the hardcore influence of it all. And New York, Boston, right. even Providence, man, dude. There was a point in time where Brooklyn battled Providence for like the weirdest acts. You know what I <laughs> really? mean? Like, yeah. And I used to play in a band based out of Providence. Really? In the early two thousands, yeah. Um, but there, there's a ton of bands that came out of Providence that I respect. Nice. Yeah. Awesome, man. Yeah. 
You know, one thing I'll circle back uh, to, and it's something that I like to ask uh, a lot of times, especially uh, when you when you're kind of doing your own support and going out and doing some of these tours and whatnot. I know that sometimes you can end up playing some pretty bizarre gigs. So, what are some of the uh, more strange gigs that y'all have played? And feel free to tell me if there's anyone in particular where there was just equipment meltdowns. I mean, I know from setting up a Zoom recorder and and three GoPros. And doing like projections and running samples, I inevitably fuck something up every yeah. time that I've ever done that for a show. Yeah. I mean, we're always having technical issues. I mean, yeah. there's three of us and a shit ton of gear, lights, projections, right. a pedal board that looks like it's NASA approved. Right. When we were on tour in Europe, we played a show in like this this old, like grimy punk rock slash squat bar mm-hmm. in Belgium. Okay. <laughs> and uh, dude, we blew all the power in a building. No way. Yeah. Oh, boy. Blew all the power, fried half of um, the guitar pedal board. Oh, no. Yeah, and a lot of it, like, we couldn't swap out for European parts. And right. And we couldn't get it in time. Oh, man. So we li- we played the set, but we played it with no lights, no projections, and no pedals. Just wow. Just played old stuff really loud and ripped it in a pitch black room. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, we weren't not going to play. You right. know what I mean? Yeah, so, you went all the way there. You're going to yeah, play, but come fuck, on, that man. also sucks because I would imagine pedals are a pretty crucial component of what y'all do at least from the guitar sound perspective. That wall and all the delay and all that yeah. stuff, that's yeah. pedals. Yeah, we were pretty much piecemealing it for wow at least a week trying to get it figured out what about we- a weird show in particular your hometown oh in new orleans oh boy what happened we've <laughs> always had a, a weird a weird time in new orleans yeah it's a weird town always yeah totally so we were on a tour with liturgy it was the first time we ever played in new orleans it was an off day uh-huh. so we scheduled a show for it yeah just on it uh-huh we scheduled a show and we show up and this place looks like, first of all, I forget what ward it's in, uh-huh. but it was in a pretty like desolate uh, part of town. I know that there was a prison down the street. Okay. And, I mean, if it was close to it. And N-O-P-P. a brand new Whole Foods. Okay. Huh. I don't know exactly. Fifth where... Ward, maybe? I don't, I don't, I don't know. know, man. I don't know of I mean I don't I don't know of one that's really close to the prison necessarily. It was in a uh, very industrial commercial area. Okay. Yeah, big time. Like there's nothing around, dude. Huh. Um and we roll up to this place and it looks like this jo- like a giant old airplane hangar. And we walk in and it was the most bizarre thing, man. There's a 80-year-old man in his underwear painting on an easel. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. There's someone making chili in the kitchen. <laughs> right. Then we you keep walking down through the the path in this airplane hangar and there was a makeshift homemade bar that only served a few different types of homemade absinthe. Whoa. And there was three gentlemen sitting at this bar wearing full on German lederhosen. <laughs> really? <laughs> Okay, and then there was a row of old sofas, couches, uh-huh. and like lazy boy recliners, and behind those was like like a mini like tent city, and all these people were just sleeping or chilling in tents. Holy shit! Inside this airplane hangar. <laughs> and then we played on the floor, and behind us was this giant wooden cross with an old TV hanging on it that just played static the whole time. What? And uh, blew the power in this place a couple times, too. <laughs> I bet y'all did. Yeah. You're lucky you didn't catch it on fire. Yeah. I don't know if it was up to code. Yeah. <laughs> Holy shit, man. Um, wow. But people were there. It was insanely bizarre, okay? And then after we were done playing, um, my guitar player has a... It's not even an infatuation. It's a problem, I uh-huh. call it, with fireworks. Oh. And he had bought fireworks at some point before we played New Orleans. Yeah. And he decides to, out in the street, start lighting off bottle rockets. Yeah. And within 10 minutes, cops roll up. Uh-oh. And they were like, we got a report. 
someone said they heard gunfire yeah. in the area and he's holding a bottle rocket while it's going off and the cops are telling him screaming at him to put it out and he's like I can't and he's just shooting it at the ground and he's like I can't put it out you know what I mean and cooler has prevailed it was a harmless act but uh you know nonetheless it wrapped up a night of complete bizarre bizarro land <laughs> <laughs> that ah. one will always stick out in my brain. I'll as say a, it was, it was, it was, I don't even, dude, I mean, I explained it to you. Yeah. Like how I remember it. Right. It's hard to believe that it's even real hearing you explain it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Holy shit, man. Yeah. Well, you win. We, I don't know what the prize is, yeah. but I think you won. That was a crazy one, man. You certainly got a fucking story out of it. Yeah, from New Orleans. Yeah, no no less, right? Yeah. Oh, my God, that's yeah. nuts, dude. Yeah. Wow. Well, Christopher, it was good talking to you, man. Uh, thanks for swinging by. Keep keep me posted so I can know what's what's happening with your bands. And Yeah. yeah. Sonhead's working on some new material. Um, we'll keep churning away at that. And then I got a few other things in the works, too, that I'm working on, a couple new projects and such. Nice. So, yeah. Hopefully you'll be seeing the light of day soon. There you go, man. Yeah. Right on. Cool, Good man. talking to you, man. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, you're right. Thanks for tuning in, everybody, and thanks to Christopher swinging by to rap. Be on the lookout for Sunnet tearing it up live, as well as a new record, hopefully coming out sooner rather than later. And we'll catch you on the next one, as always. Tune in. Crash, bang, boom. <laughs>